Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is Jean Helms, and I am the Administrative Director of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. I'm joined today in this video by my sister Katie, who joins us from upstate New York. We're also joined by members of the staff, Reverend Oscar Sinclair, Bob Fusen, Chelsea Krafka, and Kelly Ross, who are helping with reflections, music, and support. And several of us are present in the chat room running beside this YouTube video on Sunday morning. We also have a lay pastoral care person on call this morning. So if you need to talk to someone, reach out and we will get you in contact with them. We're still practicing this new way of being together. We've learned how to be a church together and apart. Much has changed around us, but what has not changed is the vision that we have. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and transform the world. We have a big vision here, and we know that creating a loving community begins with welcome. So whether this is your first time joining this community or your 500th, if you have stumbled onto this YouTube video by accident, or you're a longtime member, if you came here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome here with us. More than ever, it is important that we share the love and warmth and light of this place. So our ask to you is simple. Do not keep this church a hidden gem invite people to come. Perhaps put a yard sign in your front yard. We have this service which premieres on Sunday morning, Zoom Vespers on Thursday night, interviews and daily updates on YouTube, open circle groups, adult game nights, and music. Join us. As we enter into worship, take a moment to center yourself wherever you are. Find a comfortable place within your body. Bring yourself into the present moment and let us begin. This morning and all mornings, we are called to pay attention. We are called to pay attention to our individual lives, to our delights and pains. We're called to understand and cherish ourselves, to take good care of ourselves, to know ourselves as loving and worthy of love. In paying attention to our lives, we give thanks for all that is good in them and work to make the best decisions we can to help us live fully and joyfully. Today and all days, we are called to pay attention. We are called to pay attention to the people in our lives, to celebrate their joys with them and to tend them in their struggles. We're called to bring our compassion, kindness, and patience to our relationships, even as we, were gr we are grateful for the compassion, kindness, and patience others show to us. In paying attention to the people in our lives, we give thanks for their presence and work to support them in the best of our abilities. Throughout our lives, we are called to pay attention. We are called to pay attention to the society in which we live. We are called to understand the ways in which the lives of, the peop of people we don't know and never will know are made harder by political and economic policies that value some kinds of people over other kinds of people. In paying attention to our society, we give thanks for the many people who are working for justice for everyone. And we join in working with them so that all people are treated with the dignity and worth they possess. In all that we do, we are called to pay attention. 
We are called to pay attention to the natural world around us. We are called to understand how our decisions help the natural world to flourish or cause it harm. In paying attention to the natural world, we give thanks for the ways it sustains and enriches our lives. And we commit to living sustainably so that all beings have the chance to live and so that many generations after our own can celebrate the planet and its gifts. Love, compassion, gratitude, and the demands of justice call us to pay attention. As we pay attention, we bless ourselves, each other, our society, and the world. This reading comes to us from Jan Richardson, and it's called Blessing That Meets You in Love. It is true that every blessing begins with love, that whatever else it might say, love is always precisely its point. But it should be noted that this blessing has come today especially to tell you it is crazy about you that it has been in love with you forever, that it has never not wanted to see your face to go through this world in your company. This blessing thought it was high time it told you so, just to make sure you know. If it has been shy in saying this, it has not been for any lack of wanting to. It is just that this blessing knows the risk of offering itself in a way that will so alter you. Not because it thinks you can stand some improving, but because this is simply where loving leads. This blessing knows how love undoes us, unhinges us, unhides us. It knows how loving can sometimes feel like dying. But today, this blessing has come to tell you the secret that sends it to your door that it gives itself only to those willing to come alive, that it vows itself only to those ready to be born anew. Each year at the spring congregational meeting, our members vote for 10 local organizations. And about once a month, we feature one of those organizations and give them the offering plate on a Sunday. The Share the Plate recipient this month is FoodNet, and we are not able to have people speak with us in person. So instead, we've pre-recorded a short uh, video and we're showing you a snippet of that longer video today. The longer video is uploaded to our YouTube channel. Hello, I'm here with our friend Kathleen Weiser from FoodNet and we're gonna hear a little bit more about the work and also about Kathleen's involvement in FoodNet. I wanted to introduce her first and um, let you know what we're doing today. Um, so to get started, why don't 
you tell us just a little bit more about FoodNet and how it works? Uh, you can actually, we serve as Crete, Denton, Milford, Seward, and Lincoln. So there's 18 different locations, two of which are temporarily closed. So you can look at our Facebook page okay. if you need food and uh, find out what time each day someone is distributing. And there is no limitation. If you need food every day, you could come every day. We don't ask for your income, your job, social security number. Just okay. your first name and how many in your household. That's good to know. We also it, have a food net. Uh, Foodnetlincoln.org is our website. And we're always looking for volunteers because a lot of our volunteers are senior citizens that are uh, more at risk too. Mm -hmm. so. so if somebody were wanting to volunteer their time, if they were not able to give money um, or both, um, how, how would they get in touch with you to... Talk about okay. volunteering. Right. You could uh, contact us through Facebook. Okay. And uh, we pick up seven days a week and we give away the food seven days a week. Unlike the local food pantry, we deal with the perishable and all mm -hmm. kinds of food. How many pickup sites are there total? Actually, there's over a hundred. Wow. Not all of them are, are daily or weekly or some are just on call as they have a product that is in excess they overstocked on or something that's getting close to a sell date and mm -hmm. they need to move it and and i've uh worked up to retirement now so i volunteer i'm a uh, serve on the board and i also uh, serve as co-coordinator at our site wow. as my father always said adapt improvise and overcome <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time today, Kathleen. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you and for this opportunity. As this next song plays, please consider giving a contribution to FoodNet as a part of our Share the Plate offering. You may send a check with FoodNet written in the memo line. You can give online through Realm, our online database. Or you could try your hand at text giving right now with your smartphone. Just text UC Lincoln space and the amount that you wish to give to 73256. And then select the share the plate option on the next screen. These instructions are also in the chat box to the right of this video. a boy each week on Sunday we would go to church and pay attention to the priest and he would read the holy word and consecrate the holy bread and everyone would kneel and bow today the only difference is everything is holy now everything 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 is holy now And when I was in Sunday school We would learn about the time Moses split the sea in two Jesus made the water wine And I remember feeling sad Miracles don't happen still Everything's a miracle Wine from water is not so small But an even better magic trick Is that anything is here at all So the challenging thing becomes When holy water was rare at best, it barely 
at my fingertips But now I have to hold my breath Like I'm swimming in a sea of air It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down But I walk it with a reverend air Cause everything is holy now a scripture verse It made me want to bow my head I remember when church let out How things have changed since then Everything is holy now It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down But I walk it with a reverend air Everything is holy now. My sister Katie advised me to drop into my heart before beginning my reflection. So I'm going to start by asking all of you to take a deep breath with me one more time as we all drop into our hearts. Radical love is channeled through humanity. It has to be lived and embodied, shared and refined, not in the heavens, but right here and now, in the messiness of earthly life. Omid Safi. I would certainly describe these last few weeks and months as messy. It was pretty difficult for me to slow down the squirrel cage in my brain long enough to write this reflection. The speed at which events and changes are occurring both internationally and locally is somewhat breathtaking. But one thing that I pledge to do for my own self-care is to go back and pay attention again to the words of Skylar Gary Zink in her sermon in May on stillness. I'm convinced that this is one of the keys to my own sustained resilience, finding stillness and slowing down. Our world is changing. Humanity is changing. And we are being invited to dig deeper than we have ever done before. So what follows for me is this, how do we embrace our vision and transform ourselves in order to respond to this changing landscape, this changing humanity? Quaker blogger Liz Opp says, radical love is the transformational element in my spiritual life that allows me to open my heart in a way that embraces, welcomes, and cherishes those who I had intentionally or unintentionally excluded from my life in the past. Those who I had somehow seen as other instead of seeing them as my siblings. 
that really resonates with me because it mirrors what we've been talking about in our UU Connects group this month. We've been exploring the Buddhist concepts of suffering and compassion <clears throat> in order to examine how we may further open our hearts to ourselves and each other. To take this one step further, I would pose the question, how may we open our hearts to all living beings? How can we embrace radical love for all living beings and then use that love to transform ourselves and our world? Omid Safi says, as so many teachers have reminded us, it is when love moves into the public square that we call it justice. It is the same love that pours out of God's own being and brings us here, that sustains us here, that will take us back home. It is the same love that we recognize in other people who love their babies and their community as we love our babies and our community. When we recognize the same love in one another, we will not stand for having something happen to another people's babies and community that we would not want to have happen to ours. That is simply what we call justice. And this work of justice is a task of love. To be a mystic on the path of radical love necessitates tenderness in our intimate dealings and a fierce commitment to social justice in the community we live in, both local and global. I was originally inspired to write and share about radical love through the writings of Omid Safi. <clears throat> Omid Safi is a director of Duke University's Islamic Studies Center and a columnist on On Being. He's a specialist in the study of Islamic mysticism and he is committed to traditions that link together love and justice. Safi says, if love is a vessel that carries God to us, then it comes to us through our bodies. We have to love the body, honor the body, cherish the body and protect the body. Okay. Okay, I'm beginning to see the connections here. I, I'm beginning to see how we have to begin with ourselves in order to open our hearts and join in working with those working for justice. So I guess we begin with ourselves and we begin by paying attention to our own hearts. Here are more of Safi's words reframed for current times. Don't ask me about my mystical practice if all our relations on the Navajo re reservation are dying en masse with the highest rates of the coronavirus. Don't go searching for a mantra if some of us are living in cages and having our children taken away from us at the border. Don't talk to me about love if a fifth of our population goes to bed hungry at night. We cannot fill each other's hearts with love if our bellies are perpetually empty. The dignity of human beings matters. Black lives matter. My parents always told me, work hard and stay in school. Trust the church and leaders of our town. But now that I am older, the violence that I see, the trust I had is slowly breaking down. There's a fire in Ferguson tonight. It's not the kind of fire you see. It burns in everyone who seeks justice, truth, and deed. to school, graduated proud of my degree. In the news, another killing, a young black life cut short. Police have turned their guns on you and me. There's a fire in Ferguson tonight. It's not the kind of fire you see. I 
This is Psalm 23 for this moment by Kevin Tarsa. May I remember in this tender moment that love is my guide, always shepherding me toward ways of openness and compassion. I have what I need, really, with love at my side, above me, below me, in front of me, behind me inside every cell of me. Love infused everywhere. Just when the weight of the world I inhabit threatens to drop me in place and press my hope down into the ground beneath me, love invites me to rest for a gentle while and leads the center of my soul to the quiet, still, restoring waters nearby that somehow I had not noticed. And so love, quietly, sets me once again on its tender and demanding path. Even when the walls close around me and the cries of death echo through untold corners, gripping my heart with fear and sadness, I know, I know that all will be well, that I will be well, when love whispers near to me, glints at the corner of my eye, rests with gentle and persistent invitation upon my shoulders. Yes, love blesses me, even as the sources and symbols of my pain look on. Love blesses me from its infinite well, and I turn and notice that goodness and kindness and grace follow me everywhere, everywhere I go. I live in a house of love, love that will not let me go. I live in a house of love and I always will. My teacher Thea Elijah says, in relationship to the divine, it is not our beliefs that are important, but our direct experience. 
The aim of Sufism is self-cultivation for the sake of merging our hearts with the divine heart so that our whole life is lived as an act of love. This love is not sentimental. It is clear and simple and truthful without being judgmental. Many spiritual paths seek to transcend the body, the ego, and worldly life. Sufism is a path for those who wish to infuse our earthly lives with the direct experience of the sacred and live every moment in a holy way. Sufis do not transcend earthly experience. They seek to clean and open themselves fully so that they become more and more capable of dissolving directly into the love. These teachings and practices connect them with vast resources of personal resilience resiliency and transpersonal awareness, allowing them to meet their daily life challenges with heart and humor and deeply loving directness. I learned the following prayer from Thea and I'd like to share it with you. The Fatiha, is ha it happens to be the opening of the Quran. It's used as a ritual prayer and something that's recited at the beginning or the opening of any action. My teacher likens it to pressing control save, locking in the, open, the openness just created in your heart and saving it at the soul level in a no turning back sort of way. I think we often stay in our minds and in that state we can get caught up in the meaning of words and translations. The beauty for me in singing in a language I don't speak is that I can receive the full vibrational healing of each word without my mind getting involved in the slightest. So I invite each of you to drop into yourselves and let the aperture of your heart be propped open a little further by our time together today. And let yourself receive the guidance, mercy, and light of the Fatiha. Oh, Jubilee Mini Shaitan Rajim. Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Ya kanabdu ya kanastain idinat sarat al mustaqim sarat al adina namta alayhum ghayr madub alayhum wallahu Love is my guide, shepherding me toward ways of openness and compassion. Love sets me once again on its tender and demanding path. These two phrases describe my journey within Unitarian Universalism extremely well. My spiritual journey over the last 20 years has broken open my heart over and over and over again. It has brought me to this present moment where I want to work harder to transform myself and transform our world. I am cautiously optimistic about our future. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. popularized the notion of beloved community. He envisioned the beloved community as a society based on justice, equal opportunity, and love of one's own fellow human beings. Dr. King said, our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. I see this as parallel to some of the shifts that we're beginning to see around the nation these last few weeks. We are seeing 
qualitative changes in some people's souls. We're seeing quantitative changes in Minneapolis and in Albuquerque. There is much work left to be done. There is a sermon that was presented to a white congregation a couple of years ago entitled White Supremacy and Beloved Community by Amanda Udis Kessler. Amanda's intro reads, Unitarian Universalism is taking a profoundly important step in committing to work as an entire body, a beloved community against white supremacy. In order to make this commitment as effective as possible, it is important to reflect on the internal struggle that we who are white may undergo as we come to recognize, accept the reality of, and commit to working against white supremacy. These responses and emotions can halt us in our tracks, or we can recognize them and work with them to enable ourselves to move forward and to support each other along the way. Amanda Udis Kessler's sermon goes on to lay out beautifully how white Unitarian Universalists can dig deeper and do the soul work needed to build beloved community. Amanda asks us to halt in our tracks and ensure that all people are treated with dignity and worth. She is asking us to do the hard work of transforming ourselves so that we may in turn transform our world. At the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, <clears throat> our recent relationship with these issues have had some stops and starts. But you know, we need to remember that the seeds we've been planting for decades are beginning to sprout. More people are answering the call. It is clear that young people, and in particular young black and indigenous women are taking the microphone. They are sounding the call for justice and many are paying attention. Many people's hearts are breaking open and changing and many are responding to the call of justice with their bodies and their voices and by showing up. The world has entered into this new era, this call for justice. And at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, there are things that we can do collectively to be ready to answer that call. A task force was formed earlier this year to address issues of racial justice and racial bias. The new official name for this task force is the Unitarian Church of Lincoln Task Force for Dismantling White Supremacy. With the task force, we will explore the church's history with racial justice and bias. We will recognize the work that our members and friends, ministers and staff have done toward creating change and combating oppression, both internally and externally. Once we recognize this past and bring ourselves back to the present moment, then we can identify action steps and take those actions. <clears throat> As individuals, we can continue to pay attention to our own growing edges. Growing edges are the places in our life we really want to live our life from, but we're too scared to go there. They are the parts of our lives that make up our life curriculum, the things that we return to over and over that need work. We can explore these growing edges and how we want to be in the world. We can realize real lasting changes in our own lives and in our community. We can show up and prove the point that radical love really is just love with a double shot of justice. Now, I'm not usually one to spoil the ending, but I'm going to share the closing paragraph of Amanda's sermon white supremacy and beloved community. If you want to learn more from Amanda about building beloved community and how white people in particular can address their fears and grow, please read the full text of this sermon. The link is in the chat box. The final paragraph is as such. When we, as the beloved community, make these promises and act on them, 
we join the prophetic people who make up the history of Unitarianism and Universalism, and those who are hard at work in today's Unitarian Universalism. And with these promises and actions, we proclaim our commitment to a world bursting with joy for all people. A world where people of color do not need to confront racial slurs, discrimination, or violence. A world where no one needs to specify that Black Lives Matter because it is so patently obvious that they do. We don't live in that world yet, but we are working our way toward it, one person at a time, one action at a time, one stage at a time, and we are taking care of each other along the way. Let us go back to those words of the bold and beautiful revolutionary students from the 60s nonviolence movement. They talked about this love that penetrates justice as the agent of social transformation. Courage displaces fear, love transforms hate, acceptance dissipates prejudice, hope ends despair, peace dominates war, faith reconciles doubt. On April 4th, 2018, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Omid Safi was among the speakers at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis where King was murdered. He said, I spoke about love as I experienced it as a Muslim, but it is the same love I see Martin talked about, not merely an emotion, but the unleashing of God if you love people and you experience that kind of love, you cannot help but be concerned when people are suffering and you are moved to act. I believe that it, the time is ripe in these strange, beautiful and messy times of pandemic to continue the hard work of building beloved community together. This work of justice is a task of radical love. May we open our hearts and pay attention to those who are fighting for racial justice. May we allow radical love to set us once again on its tender and demanding path. A couple announcements as we move to the, a close of our time together. Last night, we had a family movie night and gathered to watch the movie Up. Let us know if you'd like to continue to have more of these family movie nights in the future. And tonight, Sunday, June 21st at, at 7 p.m. Central Time, we're hosting an adult movie night for the movie based on Brian Stephenson's memoir, Just Mercy. We'll follow this up with a movie discussion group on Tuesday, June 23rd at 7 p.m. Zoom links will be shared in daily e-blasts and on our private Facebook social group. Worship over the next week is going to look a little bit different. Starting on Wednesday, Unitarian Universalists gather from around the country and indeed the world for our annual General Assembly. Now, as planned, we would have met in Providence, Rhode Island, but in practice this year, uh, we will be online. And so for the next week, rather than hold competing services here on our uh, online channels is the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we'd instead like to invite all of you to participate in the public worship services of General Assembly. First, the service of the Living Tradition on Thursday night at 5, and again for the General Assembly Sunday service, Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. I know these times are a little bit different, but it's a chance to be with literally thousands of Unitarian Universalists in worship, hearing from some of our most beloved and talented voices. I also want to say something about this summer. I am happy to announce that we'll be participating in the 2020 Unitarian Universalist Cooperative Summer Worship Series. When our congregations pivoted suddenly to online worship back in March, in response to the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, we all had to invent new formats and adapt to new technologies instantly. Many of our ministers across the country and tech staff and volunteers rose to this occasion. 
with great creativity and skill. So now, uh, during what is for most Unitarian Universalist congregations a traditional summer break and study time, we take this opportunity to share our discoveries and learn from each other through a series of virtual visits to Sunday services with a cluster of our neighbor congregations. Through the gift of online worship, you will hear from some of our newest up-and-coming young preachers and some of our wisest senior colleagues. I'll just say as Oscar, I did not actually write that line. You will experience how a variety of congregations have embraced the challenges of these new formats, and our sound, video, and streaming tech folks will enjoy a little well-deserved time off. Look for our separate community gatherings to resume in September. I'm posting the list of congregations participating in the chat next to this video, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues and participating in this series, as well as the opportunity on August 16th to show the larger UU movement the amazing things that we've done here in Lincoln. That's all for today for announcements. Have a lovely afternoon. Come join us for General Assembly this week, and I'll see you soon. close with these words by Elena Westbrook. Go in hope, for the arc of the universe is long and we can bend it towards justice. Go in courage, for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and in the larger world. Go in love, because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our lives. Amen and blessed be.